What we're going to look at today is he's going to talk about this mystery and how now it's actually met with men. How this mystery of the ages has met with men. That's us. And I'm not talking about just men, you know, gender. I'm talking about all mankind. It has come to us, this mystery. So the question that begs is, if this mystery is worth more than the lottery, what in the world is this mystery and why is it so good? And why is it I don't wake up every morning appreciating it? Yeah, well, let's try that and see. So this is what he's going to talk about, the mystery that meets man. And I've split it into three sections uh, about the men themselves through the beneficiaries, which includes us, and the minister of this mystery, which is Paul, and then the mystery itself. And just to scramble your heads just a little bit, I'm not going to follow it in that order just because well, I don't have to. <laughs> no, because it makes a little more sense. You'll see when I, when I talk about it. So we're going to start actually with the minister. We're going to start in verse 24. We'll come back to the men earlier, but I just want to start with the, Paul talking about himself as the minister of this, and we'll build the anticipation for what the mystery is and why it is beyond value in terms of riches. So here's where we're going to start, verse 24. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. And all, all he's really talking about is the fact that if, if Christ were alive in the flesh, he's alive in spirit, but if he was alive in the flesh, he would still be suffering for bringing you the message of what this is. And so now Paul's the one who's being that messenger, and he's suffering because of that. In fact, as he's writing this letter to Colossae, He's sitting in a jail cell in Rome. And so he, what he's going to make the point here is, I'm a messenger of this stuff, but don't feel bad for me because this is worth it. it is, this, is, this is a treasure so incredibly valuable that if it costs me sitting in a jail cell, then it's all worth it. That's the point he's making right here. And he's doing it just because he's doing it on Christ's behalf. And then he goes on, verse 25 of which I became a minister. So he says this, this mystery, this incredible thing, he's now the minister. That word minister, by the way, there is the same word in Greek that we get when we call people deacons. It's diakonos, it's, and it just literally means a servant. Servant, servant, servant. So if you were in the early first century, and you went into someone's house, and you had dinner there, and someone served you food that was not related to the family, it was a ser- that w- they would be a di- diakonos. They'd just be a servant. They just do stuff. They, they serve people. So that's what he says, I'm a servant now for this mystery to, to do that. And he says, this, this, I'm a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. And again, he uses more servants' words right here, that stewardship word. Uh, it's a word we looked at years ago, you probably don't remember, oikonomos. Oikos means house or home. Nomos means law. So it's the law of the house. That's what a servant in the house does is they do what the law of the house is. So a house servant does the rules of the house. They're oikonomos, home, law, people. So they make that stuff happen. It, it really is, this word stewardship is a great definition because what it says is you serve according to the rules of the house, but you don't own anything in the house. You just serve what is owned by the owner of the house. So you're, you're a steward. This stuff doesn't belong to you but you still are the one who's tasked with delivering it for the benefit of the ones it's going to. So it's a stewardship. It's not really your stuff. So Paul says, God made me a minister. He made me a servant of this great good news. And it's something that I don't even own. It's something that God owns, but I just carry it around for people's benefit, like a home servant, like a oikonomos, like a diakonos. So that's what he's saying. So when you take those two words and you put them together, what exactly is his job? And he tells us what this job is. He's been given by God, and here it is. To make the word of God fully known. Now, if you were with us a couple of weeks ago and we looked at the, uh, the Gnostic burgers, this is a hit against the Gnostics. Because the Gnostics were really big into saying, there's secret knowledge. Gnostic actually means knowledge. There's secret knowledge. I know something you don't know. And as a result that I know the secret knowledge and you don't, then that puts me up here and you're down here. And someday you'll aspire to that secret knowledge and you'll come up. And so there's actually this stair-stepped uh, approach to privilege and authority in the Gnostics depending on what secret knowledge you knew. Well, Paul says, eh, not with Christ. <laughs> he says his job is to make the word of God fully known which means by by implication no secrets allowed it's everything in another place in acts when he meets with the elders from ephesus when he's pulling through ephesus uh, he says listen when i was in ephesus with you which he was for three years i did not i did not withhold anything of the full spectrum of god's word i told you the whole guacamole you got the whole thing because in christianity and with christ there are no secrets so paul's servant his servant task as a steward 
is to take this incredible gospel and to make it fully known. No questions, no holes, no secrets. That's what he's all about. Interestingly enough, when he says that this is his job, what is not on that list is what's telling. For instance, he doesn't add to that list that I came to establish this or to establish that or to grant any authority or to do any of those kinds of things which you'd think he would list. God called me to be a minister, a steward of the stuff he's giving, and all I did was talk about God's word. Now, see, that's, that's really interesting. If you, have, if you have someone from a religious community that says, the benefit to you because I'm the authority of you is because either the authority or some other kind of special powers or something I might give to you or something like that, Paul, that wasn't part of Paul's calling at all. His calling was 100% to bring the word of God and to make it fully known. Now, that, it's, it's why we put such a high value on the word, why we spend so much time on Sunday mornings about the word, because the word is paramount and central to everything. And for Paul, it was his entire ministry. And that's how God planted churches all through Asia Minor and then into Italy and throughout the world, 100% with him just speaking the word of God in its fullness. So can the information in the word of God change the world? Yes. <laughs> yes. And in a way that, you know, we don't have time to explain too much, but in a way that is far more than meets the eye. Many times we think, well, you mean just actually teaching knowledge brings some kind of transformation? Well, Jesus said you'll know the truth and it'll set you free, so maybe that's what we're talking about? Well, that's just the beginning of the process because with God, the word of God, who is Jesus himself, the word is more than just information on a page. The word is God's will made manifest and executed. So for instance, you go back to Genesis 1. What were the raw materials that God used, God used to create the universe? He just spoke. So here we have this distinction in that the word, when you read it in the, in the New and the Old Testament, the word isn't just information on a page like it does, is for us in the modern age. The word is, is the expressed will of God. That's not just a description of his will, but it is his will in action. Now, that distinction is something that in the ancient times was given only to kings anyway. Because kings, kings were in so much control, a king could sit in his throne room and say, I want this to happen, this is my word, and his expectation and everyone's expectation is that his word would happen. Well, only with kings does that work. Well, how about the king of kings and lord of lords and the creator of the universe? He speaks, it happens. So this is why when Paul says, I'm going to make fully known the word of God, this is an actionable, executable will of God made known. It, we're talking about God's will manifest in your presence when we're talking about his word. So it's really a, it's a, it's a much larger thing. So that's his job. It's not to infer authority on anybody. It's not to necessarily establish anything, although church is established. It's just to bring the word of God. And in fact, when he talks to the Corinthian church, remember, you know, he, he says in his letters, I, f I had focus when I came to you. I had focus. You know what my focus was? Christ and him crucified. What? <laughs> That's the word manifest and made flesh. I mean, so Paul, who was actually intellectually capable of arguing you into the kingdom because of his, his training in the Old Testament. He could, he could pull out Old Testament passages and just whip them out and then almost force you, twist your arm to believe who Jesus was. He says, I don't do that. I didn't come to you with fancy speech. I didn't come to you bringing all of my applied pharisaical training. I focused on Christ and him crucified. That changed the world. It's simple. And you, and, but it's still profound. Okay, so that's his job, and that's what he's been doing. That's the minister we just talked about. Now let's look about the mystery, because he says, remember, back here, he says, I'm going to make it fully known, including, we need a drum roll, the mystery. And here comes the mystery. We're so cheap, aren't we? Okay, the mystery, here comes, hold on to your seats. The mystery. Now a lot of people say, didn't you just say there's no secrets? Didn't you say that everything is out in the open? What are you talking about, about mysteries? So God's been deceiving people all this time and keeping this secret. What's he doing? I thought you, hey, 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 hey. Okay, in the next breath, Paul defines what this mystery is. In the nature of why he calls it a mystery. He says it right in the next breath. Here he goes. He defines it right here. The mystery is 
something that's been hidden for ages and generations, but now it's revealed to the saints. So it's something that now God is actively revealing through what Paul's doing. So Paul's call to, call, to, to make fully known what the word of God is, that includes this mystery, which somehow has been lost in previous generations. In a second, we'll see what it is, and you'll realize it's, it's not absolutely been lost, but it just hasn't been on the top of most people's minds. And I can prove that to you in just a second. So, what, so it's this mystery, this mystery. This is the $1.6 billion lottery of all time. This is the mystery, and he's going to define it for us. To them, talking, talk to them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches, there's the lottery, are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Paul just tell us what the mystery is. <laughs> he's he's kind of dragging you, dragging you. Actually, if you read Ephesians 3, you know that he's already mentioned part of the mystery right here. It's this right here. That this these gigantic riches from God is coming to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. When you read Ephesians 3, he says, that's it. That, that's it. He actually extends the mystery in Ephesians 3, if you keep reading to the end of the chapter, and he extends it right now to about, actually to put it in the center of the discussion. So part A of the mystery, and that's what I call right here, this is, this is part one of the mystery, is the fact that the Gentiles are included in these riches. And, and again, Ephesians 3, I, in fact, I'd recommend, if you haven't read Ephesians 3 in a long time, it, uh, the, the page of Ephesians 3 and this page of Colossians 1, if I was on a desert island and stranded and had nothing in the Bible, I would choose page chapter 3 of Ephesians and page chapter 1 of Colossians because it's got it all. In very few words, it's got it all. So, but read Ephesians 3. It's interesting. So that's part one of the mystery. The Gentiles are in? What do you mean the Gentiles are in? Now, the reason that that's been hidden for a long time isn't because God didn't reveal it before. It's because the Jews kind of repressed it. And why? Well, because the Jews started to develop this attitude that they were the chosen people. Now, that's not a wrong attitude because they were the chosen people. God chose them expressly in a way he did not choose the other nations. Does that mean that Israel was somehow better? Eh, no, and that was their problem. They thought they were. They thought they were. There's, there's actually a place where God says, you know, I, I didn't pick you just because you're great people. In fact, you're sort of irritating. <laughs> In fact, you're very irritating. There's nothing special about them that God chose them. But he did choose them specifically for a purpose. And the purpose of Israel was to create a community in real where God was at its center, where he was the king and not a physical king, but a God is king. He was the one at the center. And to make this community of God living in the midst of mankind and in community with him, and then to use that to express to the world that this is God's intention for everybody. So really, Israel was a model nation that way. But <sighs> things went to pot because <laughs> Israel went to pot. And they started to get a little uppity about this role they had. And they got this feeling that they were quite superior to everyone else. And in the process of this very natural thing that you do too, where you feel like God chose you because you're something hot, they started to forget the fact that God's intention is to bless the entire world this way, not just Israel. And so the mystery got forgotten. Now, I can prove to you this is the case. Job, uh, not Job, Jonah. Jonah, Jonah. We studied Jonah, the famous prophet who did the whale thing and stuff like that. Why was it that Jonah did not want to go to Assyria, go to Nineveh? Why was it that although God said, Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach to them, why didn't he want to go there? Well, the first thought is, well, it's because Nineveh and Assyria was the enemy of Israel and they're going to kill him. Why would you walk in there, you know, single-handed? They're going to kill him. That's not the answer. The answer, what we find out when you read through Jonah, is Jonah knew that God was gracious and slow to anger and loving and it was going to give these people an opportunity to repent and he didn't want that because Jonah hated the Ninevites. Now, how did Jonah know that God's loving kindness might actually be visited on the nastiest people on the planet? Well, because he understood the mystery that had become forgotten, that God's loving kindness extends to all mankind who will respond to what God offers to them, and Jonah was afraid they would respond in the positive. He hated, he hated that. He went and sulked under a plant, and it, he really got mad because they did. <laughs> they, they repented, and that really torqued him off. And, and as you close off Jonah, he's sitting under a plant, 
just, just having a hissy fit. <laughs> he just hates it. So this, this is what you find out when you, oh gosh, I'm getting a phone call. Are any of you calling me right now? Oh, it's a private number. Never mind. Um, so so this, this is the mystery that was forgotten, not because God wasn't revealing it anymore, but because the Jews in their selfishness and their self-centeredness forgot. And now when you come to the first century, it becomes apparent that that has always been the plan. This is the mystery that was forgotten. So, but that's only part one. He goes on to part two right here. The glory of this mystery, which clearly hasn't said, which is, which is, if we're not going to do another drum roll. But here it comes. We didn't put seat belts on the chairs, but if you had seat belts, <laughs> this is where you'd buckle them, okay? Here you go. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's it? <laughs> yes, that's it. Now look, most religions, think about, think about false religions today. Most religions are based around some founder who has kind of a collection of great ideas, moral ideas, things you ought to do to make your life better, da da da, stuff like that. And, that. and that what you do from day to day in that religion is you try and do those things to become better, and in the process of doing better, you live by the sayings of. Back, back in the Greek days, if you were a disciple of Aristotle, uh, then you would go and you'd sit at Aristotle's feet, You'd absorb all these values and ideas from Aristotle and you'd actually shape your life around these ideas. But it was really all up to you to live those things. So if you were a disciple of Aristotle, you tried to look like Aristotle by trying to imitate him and trying to internalize his values. That's what a disciple was. But not Christianity. However, the false outside view of Christianity is it's the same thing. They'll say in the false outside view, Christianity is this Jesus guy who gave us a pretty nice list of do's and don'ts that make life better, and Christians are trying, around, trying to go around and do that do and don't list. And Paul says, no. Christianity is Christ himself in you. Now that's radically different. That's why when he's talking to these people in Colossae he's never seen, they might not have caught the fact that we're not just talking a bunch of really noble life skills of being nice, we're talking about the living Christ inhabiting every member of that body. I mean, like right now, like right now. You know, in the, in the years ago, there was this thing where people wore bracelets that said WWJD, remember that? What would Jesus do? And the idea was to try and remind yourself in any context that you're thinking, what should I do next? Well, gosh, let me think. What would Jesus do? Which was an attempt, not a wholly bad attempt, but an attempt to say, I remember the life of Jesus, and if Jesus was here right now, I got to come up with what he would do, and I'll do that. It's, it's kind of a way of mimicking or copying what Jesus would do. I, that always sort of offended me. So I changed WWJD to say, what will Jesus do? Because he's in you right now. He's in you right now. And that's a radically different thing. You don't have to actually try and mimic Jesus. You just have to allow him to live through you. And that's, that's the radical news here. I mean, that's just radical. It changes so much about what the Christian life is to start and in the middle of your life and at the end and all the way through. It's really radically different. When you become a Christian, you're a follower of Christ, Christ lives in you. And I'm not talking metaphorically. I'm not talking about E.T. where he taps Elliot's chest and says, I'll be right here. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the real living Christ in you. Now that's almost crazy. <laughs> it really is. If, if you talk to someone who doesn't know anything about Christianity and they wonder, why, why are you into this stuff? I mean, uh, you're just trying to do all these good things and they'll usually say, but I know how to do good things already. I don't need Christianity for that. I know I'm not supposed to hurt people. I know I'm supposed to help people. I mean, what do you need Christianity for? Well, I need Christianity because I need Christ to live that way. And now, now we're, talking about, we're talking about a lifestyle change that's far beyond your grasp of being able to do on your own. We're talking about actually being in circumstances that in a normal flesh you, you would never respond to. But Christ in you does. Now there is, there is to be fair, there's a fight that goes on inside of you. And it's a fight for control of who you are. 
Once you become a Christian, you have, you have God's spirit, you have Christ in you, and you can from moment to moment say, will I let myself rule right now or will I let Christ rule right now? They're really, you know, he doesn't barge in on this thing. He, he waits for you to kind of be less than even a partner where you, you yield. And when in that yielding, you let him act. That's why the what will Jesus do is actually a more appropriate thing. God, in this context, if this is left to me, uh, here I am on the freeway, uh, like that jerk that's in front of me, I'd flip up that protective cover on the switch that says missiles, I'd fire the missiles at that guy, he'd blow up in front of me, and I'd go through the ashes and the dust of the fire of his car, and I'd say, ah, it serves you right, ah, <laughs> right. <sighs> now I see you're laughing because you do this too. That's why they don't install missiles on cars, by the way. <laughs> but that's, see, that's your fleshly response. And so this fight goes on inside, what would I do if I was here? I know what I would do, because it's, it's really natural. But I say, but, but God, I want you to live in this moment. You take control of my hands, my feet, my eyes. You are in me. You glorify yourself in this moment. It's yours. And in that yielding process on a daily basis, Christ makes himself known to our community in a way that would never happen if you tried to mimic him. And this is just such a key difference. It's such a key difference. Now, what is that last phrase, the hope of glory? Well, hope, of course... Hope in the New Testament and the Old is not wishful thinking. It's not like, well, I did all this stuff and well, I just hope it happens now. Like, oh, who knows? Uh, it's like a 50-50 kind of thinking. Like, well, I don't know. It's, uh, I hope. But in the Bible, it's not like that. A, a hope is really a confident expectation of what will happen. That's the hope. I put my hopes on that. Why? Because, well, because it's going to happen. You know, if the present, in fact, is depressing and hard and burdensome, which it often is, we can, we can look forward and say, but there is a concrete future that's coming and my hope is in that and I will not be, I will not be discouraged right now. That hope still exists. I, it, you know, we talk about um, books that we read and when you read Corrie Ten Boom, she talks to her sister Betsy who died in a concentration camp. And often in that book on Hiding Place, she says, Betsy, her sister, who dies, who's in the worst of the circumstances, says to her sister, Corey, she says, but the best is yet to be. Don't get bummed by this. The best is yet to be. Well, Betsy died. <laughs> well, the best is yet to be even after that. So, so that's this hope. This word hope means an expectation that's based on a promise from God. And since God's word created the universe, God's promise and word in the future will indeed happen just as much as the concrete you're sitting on. It'll happen. That's hope. So what is the hope of glory? Well, glory is used in a general sense to talk about the second coming of Christ. That's the easy, quickest answer to that. But the glory always is about who God is and what he is and how his character, not only in the now, but in the future and eventually in the end when all injustice is dealt with, and sin is dealt with, and loving kindness from God is made full and big and visible to you, that the glory is always who God is in the present, in the near future, and in the full future. More often than not, in the New Testament, it means the full future. It means the second coming. It means when he puts everything right in that sense. So the hope, since hope is an idea of an expectation of a future event, glory in this sense probably bends more toward the future event, but it also applies in the present. It also applies in because glory is always about God. God's the only one who has glory. In, in the literal sense, the word glory means billboard. It means taking something and splashing it out big for you to see. That's how I always translate it when I see it. So the glory, that what's on the billboard is not anything about me. It's all about who God is. So the glory of who God is, I can have a hope that I will be part of understanding the nature of God in the now and the near future, and especially in the full future, because Christ is in me. That, that's, that's just so key. You remember in Acts, Paul goes around and he visits some places, and in one particular context, he goes into the town, and he says, yeah, there's something not right about you believers here. And he says, so tell me about how you became believers. They talked about the baptism. What baptism? Oh, the baptism of John. Oh, the baptism of repentance. Do you know about, do you know about the baptism of Jesus with the Holy Spirit? Well, no, we've never heard about that. So he goes through that. They, they buy into that. They're baptized in Jesus. And they get the Holy Spirit, which is Christ in you. And everything changes. 
and everything. And then there's evidence of the fact that actually God himself is living within them, which Paul sensed was not the case when he first met him. Ah. So is Christ in you the same thing as being filled by the Holy Spirit? You think this is a trick question, don't you? <laughs> well, it is. It's the, it's, a, it's the very same thing. That's what's in you. Well, wait. I, isn't the Spirit different from Jesus? Yeah. No. Yes, no. no. Yes, I know. No and yes. Yes, I know. So uh, interestingly enough, you get, uh, you get to the end of Matthew's Gospel, the, the last scene with Jesus, the risen Jesus with the apostles. And remember, he has his great commission, is what we call it, the last verse in Matthew. And, uh, and he says, go and make disciples. Blah, 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 blah. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And then you flip the page into Acts, which is the life of the early church for a long time. And you look for Jesus. Well, he shows up in chapter one of Acts in you know, the risen state. And, and basically, again, gives them another go out there and do this kind of stuff from Jerusalem, Judea, and all. You know. But then after that, Jesus is not in Acts. So didn't he say in Matthew, Lo, I'm with you until the end of the age? And where's Jesus? Why isn't Jesus walking in into all their love feasts and going, Hi, everyone, I'm here, touch me? He has to do that. But he is in the Spirit because the Spirit figures prominently in all of Acts. All of Acts. I mean, it's, that's like the major story. That's the hero of all of Acts, is the Holy Spirit. Well, that is the same as Christ in you. In you. In, actually, in you. In you. Which is why. When Christ comes at the end of the age, glory, when Christ returns, if Christ is also in you, you will return as well. See? And that's just the way it works. That, that's the way. You've been united with Christ both in his death and in his resurrection, and now he's fully in you. In fact, we mentioned Ephesians 3. Do you know that in the end of Ephesians 3, Paul drops a phrase that should knock you off your chair? He says, I'm praying that you will be filled with the fullness of God. <laughs> no. Yes. How's that possible? Christ in you. So, so he's, he's adamant about this. That, I mean, that, that should knock you off your chair. You mean that Christianity is different from everything else because instead of trying to mimic the founder, the founder himself lives in you. Yes. That is is radically different. And in case the folks in Colossae hadn't heard it, this should shake them to the core. The living Jesus lives in you. <sighs> okay, that's the mystery. We can go home now. But he, he goes back to talking about himself as a minister because what he talks about because of that mystery is really great. He says, Him we proclaim. Who's the him? Jesus, of course. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. So again, Paul, he reaffirms for us, okay, that's the mystery. I gave you the mystery, Christ in you. So, back to what I said a second ago, I'm focused and I talk about him all the time. I don't talk about the Ten Commandments. I don't talk about doing right and wrong. I don't talk about walking old ladies across the street or any kind of nice. I don't, I don't talk about feeding people who are strangers and being hospitable. I don't talk about it all. Paul says, him, him. It's him we preach. Him, him, it's him. It's him, him, him. Jesus is central to it. In fact, you know, evangelism tip 101, if you're tongue-tied and don't know what to talk to someone about when you talk about why you believe what you believe, yeah, talk about Jesus. Because that's all Paul talked about. <laughs> that's all Paul talked about, Jesus. So him we proclaim. By the way, that proclaim word is also a billboard word. It's like broadcast, which means that, you know, he would go in different places and when he would go in those places, boom, that's what he started with. That's what he ended with. He proclaimed him. That's, that's what he did. And uh, to two different kind of communities, warning everyone, teaching everyone, uh, this warning is really kind of a pre-believer thing, you know, like warning, 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 warning. Jesus and John the Baptist both did this at the, at, in the ministries. John the Baptist went around preaching a repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's a warning. Why do you need to repent? Well, because your sins have got you in deep water. Uh, th this is a warning as much as anything else. You need to repent of those. That's that kind of warning. Paul brought that warning as well because Jesus, who he's talking about, is also the judge. But then those who are post-believers, he teaches everyone with all wisdom. So, so, so Paul, is, Paul is a, you know, 
He doesn't, he doesn't figure anyone having privilege over it. We're going to talk Jesus. We're going to proclaim. We're going to broadcast him everywhere we go, both to those who don't give a rip who Jesus is, as a warning, and to those who do know Jesus, we want to teach you everything we can possibly talk about, about Jesus. In all wisdom, and again, that's a knock on Gnosticism right there, with all wisdom. And then he says, the purpose is that we present everyone mature in Christ. He does not say that we might, we might present everyone mature doing everything that Jesus would do or acting like Jesus or giving them the do and don't book so that everyone's mature because they do the do's and they don't do the don'ts. They are mature in Christ. Well, wait a second. I thought you said Christ was in you, not that you're in Christ. Both. <laughs> Read John 14, and that's exactly what Jesus prays that I would be in them and they would be in me. And I was like, I'm in. It's like a double in. Wow, that doesn't work. Double, double. I, then yes, it does. <laughs> it's a perfect unity in that sense. So he says mature in Christ. Christ. Christ is central to what it takes to mature in our walk. It, it's Christ. It's being in Christ. Now let me, let me go back and look at a word here. He says everyone. You notice how much he uses this word everyone right here? <clears throat> false teachers will use these three everyones to tell you, false, tell you that everyone's saved. Because Paul used the word everyone. <laughs> this word doesn't mean like literally everyone. It means more like anyone, which has more the connotation that it, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter if you started as a Jew, you started as a Gentile. It doesn't matter whether you live in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world, or if you live in some little podunk place called Colossae. Anyone. This is open to anyone. So this is really the mystery made clear to even the Gentiles. So this word really means anyone. But it doesn't literally mean everyone does, but it's possible. So so it's really an anyone kind of, that we might present literally anyone mature in Christ and has nothing to do with your racial background or your ethnics or anything. Anyone can participate in this. For instance, he says it explicitly in Galatians. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male or female. For you are all one by doing the things and imitating Jesus. No, because you're all one in Christ Jesus. Again, in Christ. In Christ, because he's in you. So that's what he's getting at with these everyone lines and stuff like that. I want to point out this all wisdom thing. Again, a knock on the Gnostics. Uh, it, it It really means the full breadth of what wisdom is. Uh, I, I called it super common sense. <laughs> common sense used to be what everyone knew. Sorry, this is kind of a bad illustration. Now, Common sense used to be you could go to someone and say, well, of course this is what you do. That's common sense because everyone has it. So in the sense of common sense being something that's broad and widespread and seems to be known across the universe. Everyone knows this. But this is bigger than that. This is like a supernatural, divine, everywhere wisdom word. So when he says all wisdom, he's saying that throughout the universe, there's a common sense of wisdom that God has ordained that's there. And every piece of that wisdom is part of what's part of this. So I want them basically to understand, but I want them to understand in this gigantic wisdom that encompasses the universe, okay? Job has a great, a great chapter. The chapter is escaping me right now. I'm thinking it's 25, but I know that's wrong. But Job talks about... um, about when he talks to his friends who are trying to convince him that somehow he's done something wrong and they're smarter than him. Hey, we're smarter than you. So you're suffering because you must have done something wrong. And he comes back at them and says, but you guys don't really, you guys don't grasp wisdom. wisdom." And he spends a whole chapter talking about wisdom. You guys really aren't wise. And he uses great rhetoric where he says, so where were you when God created the universe? Huh? Where were you when this happened? Where were you when God made a limit for the, for the rains and the thunderbolts in the sky? Where were you when he drew a line for the edge of the ocean? You, you guys claim you know wisdom? Where were, you, where were you when God did all this stuff? But wisdom, God ordained and he saw it and he, and he spoke it out and he said to man, the fear of God is wisdom, right? To know him is wisdom. And so he comes back and says, this wisdom is something that in the way he talks about, it's actually part of the creation of the universe. Well, that's what this all wisdom is. The wisdom of God. So Paul's job is to broadcast who Jesus is to the pre-believers as well as the post-believers and with the post-believers to take all of who God is and who Jesus is and with the fullest knowledge of the created universe tell you who this is. No secrets. It's anti-Gnostic. Super common sense. 
And then down here, this is one of our favorite words in the New Testament, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So mature, you know, you know the word mature is the end of a process, right? You start immature, like when you were 13. Well, I don't want to think about 13. 13 wasn't bad. But, but you go through a process of maturing, where you leave certain things behind and you add to who you are. Just saying, but, but you know what I'm talking about. So maturity, the word mature is a great word to use here in English because it means the end of a developmental process. And when there's an end of the developmental process, there's actually a point to it. There's a, there's a purpose to it. That's why there's a, a progress to it. So that's what this word means. It's, it's a very classic word in Greek called teleos. Again, it was another great Greek um, philosopher word that was used. And when they use the word teleos, they're talking about the fact that you, you can be at the end of a process and then when you get there, that was what you were pointing for all the time. That was the purpose. So the Greeks would use that as in, in the same way that we use what, what's your purpose in life? Like what's your end goal? What's your purpose? That's this word teleos. And so what he's saying is that because of what we teach you Christ is, you're going to be teleos in Christ. You're going to find your final ending point. You're going to find your original creator's ending point for you. And so this word encompasses the idea of being finished, or, or actually the final intent from God was this is what you were meant to be in Christ. It's like the completion of creation for you. It's the way God originally defined the original human. That was the end point of humanity is to be like this. Telios, that was the point. And the point for humanity wasn't to be independent of God, but to be literally intimately intertwined with God. Christ in you, you in Christ. That, that's the telios of mankind. That's the finish of creation it's the original design of original humans it also in that sense means this is the basic whole human it doesn't mean something that's exclusive for people who are great achievers i have reached telios no it, it's not again that creates hierarchy with those who know christ that's not it, it at all this is really coming up from negative and coming up to zero instead of elevating you to plus again it's a gnostic hit because the gnostics would say you were all at zero, but I've elevated myself to 13 because of what I know. He's saying, no, teleos, this word teleos means this was always the end point of mankind for all of us without exception and without exclusiveness. This is the basic human now complete in Christ. Everyone. And also it means to be whole in that sense. I think I had one more. No, I didn't have one. Okay, so Paul says, Again, he's talking about himself as the minister. For this I toil, which means absolutely exhaustion. This exhausts Paul. Well, you know, what exhausts you? <laughs> yeah, and many times if you have passions or hobbies, sometimes those exhaust you. Paul's saying, I have applied myself to this and this exhausts me in a good kind of way. This is how I want to spend myself. Struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Now, th this is a great phrase. This, this struggling struggling with all his energy. This struggling is a, an athletic word to mean like to run around the track. And I, he says, I'm exhausting myself. To, and I'm just, I'm applied. I'm a, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I've been called to. And I'm doing this to the point of exhaustion. He's running the race. That's why he uses that in other places. With all his energy. And you'd be surprised if you looked that word up in Greek because it, it's, it, if you pronounce it, it is energy. <laughs> in Greek, energeo. It's, it's where we get the word energy. So, and that energy comes from where? That energy that powerfully works within me. Well, who's in him? Christ is in him. So he's running this race to the fullness of his exhaustion with the energy that's supplied by the Christ that lives in him. And he says, this is what I focus my whole life on and this exhausts me and that's great. Because this mystery is worth every ounce of my energy. Now, I, I read that kind of devoted application of a life's direction and i'm a little convicted because <laughs> because paul was totally sold out he was totally sold out to christ and totally sold out to going to wherever he needed to go and all he was going to do is talk about christ and him crucified and he was sold out to that now when you read the three missionary journeys of of paul's in acts you see it i mean this guy <laughs> he did stuff i'd never ever want to want to do i mean he just he just went he just went. Can you imagine having someone send you to someplace you've never been before and say, you need to go there and just talk about Christ? First word out of your mouth in the village is Christ and your last other word is, is Christ. I mean, can you imagine? And he did that over and over and over. Far distances, didn't take any ways of means to support himself. He was shipwrecked. 
Paul actually tells us in another place everything that's gone wrong with him during that. And he says, don't worry for me. I'm exhausting myself in the one thing that I want to do more than anything else. I am focused. And this is his focus. And he says, although he's exhausted by it, God presents the energy literally within him that powerfully works within me. That word powerfully, by the way, is uh, the word dynamite. <laughs> Dynamos. We, get, we see that in Greek too. It's dynamite. Pshh, powerful. So God does this in him. Again, this is a way that you can tell that Christ lives in Paul because of what Paul accomplished was more than he could accomplish on his own. He was, he was pushed to points of despair and exhaustion when you read in Acts, but Christ's energy pushed him forward. Why? Because the mystery is so important to get across. That's why. Okay, lastly, we're going to talk about the men, finally. And I did it like this so you could see this as a case study. So we already made the case that, that Paul is a minister. He's the diaconos. He's a servant. He's a steward of this great message. And that it's because the message is so extraordinary, this mystery that's been hidden for the ages, and now, boom, it's out there. And Paul's doing this. How did it work in Colossae? <laughs> the same way that it worked in you. Like this. Verse 21. And you... And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind and doing evil deeds. Guilty. (laughs) That's us. You know, remember, Paul doesn't know these guys. He's never met these guys. He's just presuming that that's the way they are. Because we all are. And, And it's really true. So he says, look, you guys, you guys at this one state, before the mystery came and knocked on your door, you were three things. You were alienated, that means separated. Separated from who? Well, from God. You were alienated from God. You were separated from God. By the way, if a family member of yours does something really, really nasty to you, it creates alienation. The opposite word to alienation is reconciliation. So he's starting off right here saying you're alienated from God because of what you've done. You're alienated from God. Not only that, but you're hostile in mind. <laughs> you are dreaming up ways to be hostile to God. Now that, that seems a little severe to me because before I was a Christian, I don't remember dreaming up bad things for God. But you are trying to figure out how to live life without God, the creator and the one who owns this entire place. That's pretty antagonistic to start with without even giving a whit of thought to thanking the one who gave you the things you have. I mean, there's no sense at all really hostile. And now when he talks about people in Colossae who are in Asia Minor or in Turkey, I mean, they're just, they're just a stone's throw from Ephesus. Ephesus is well known at the time to be the pagan center of the world. Pagan, 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 pagan. Temple of Diana, you, you, you count on it, it's pagan. It's, I mean, it's the dark hole of the world. And these guys are just within a small radius from that. They're influenced by the same thing. So they're actually working on satanic they're on satanic worship. I mean, they, what they're thinking and doing is hostile to God, hostile to the true God. So yeah, so not only were you, were you doing bad things, but your mind was involved in bad things. <laughs> and this, I mean, this really underscores what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, because he says, you know, it's been said that you shouldn't commit adultery. But I'm saying, Bing! if you're even thinking it and wishing it, you're already guilty of it. There's a battle in your mind. So it's Paul's pointing to the same thing here. You were not only just alienated from God, your mind was working on being alienated from God. That's what's going on. And then also on top of that, it followed through with evil deeds. And he uses probably the basis language you can say to talk about your deeds. Now we're talking about people who probably did some good things in their life, <laughs> relatively speaking. But Paul's saying no. You lump all those together, evil. You're hostile to God. It's hostile to God. So... That's right. That's right. God, God notices that. Yeah, so, so he, he's saying right here, this is who you were before the mystery came into town. The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is what you were. Uh, with your best attempts, this is what you were. Now, it's not like he's buttering them up because he's basically telling him in one fell swoop, were you worthy for what happened next? No, because <laughs> that was you, and that was me. Paul talks in many places about what he was before Christ stopped him on the road to Damascus. Dirt bags of dirt bags. So that was you, that was me. I'm telling you that before the mystery knocked on your door, you just were not worthy of it. You were living a 
bad life and dreaming about how to live a badder life. That was you before, but now he has reconciled. Woohoo! This almost makes me want to scream. Well, I just did. He, it, it, because remember, you're alienated. Why? Because of what you've been doing and what you've been thinking. And now you're reconciled with God. That breach that's been separated by the wedge of your sins, psh, that's brought together. Now you're reconciled with God. And who did it? He has now reconciled. In the passive, you have been reconciled. You're not the one that reconciled. You have been reconciled. I love his language. Now you have been reconciled. That's the repaired relationship. How is it possible? And he says it in the next breath. In his body of flesh by his death. That has brought you together with God. Again, it's another Gnostic ding. Because the Gnostics highly devalued the material universe because it was full of sin. And so material, physical things, bad. Spiritual things, good. And how is it then, Paul says, that this great good has come into your life? Through the physical body of flesh by his death. He literally puts in the material stuff just to kind of dig a dig in the Gnostic thinking. (laughs) He didn't die just spiritually. He died in the flesh. The physical Jesus died. And the Gnostics would find that a repulsive thought because they would say the body of Jesus was evil. The spirit of Jesus was good, but not the body of Jesus. Well, then how can you take the body of Jesus and use that to come with this reconciling thing? So he's really just dinging them when he says this. Through the body of flesh by his death. By the way, before we leave that, it's important to note that if Jesus didn't die on the cross, then there would be no benefit to you. So, yes. And so I, the reason I say this is because, because many people will say that there's other things that Jesus did and that's sort of what got the atonement. The atonement of Christ is in his death on the cross. That's just very clear right here. If Jesus stopped short in the, in the gospel stories and never made it to the cross, we would be in deep weeds. It's the, it's the death of his body that purchased that. That's why the cross is so central. That's why we look at the cross and we see this. We see reconciliation purchased on our behalf. The death of Jesus was gruesome and horrible. You read the medical accounts of it. We don't glory in the gore of the cross. But what we do glory in is the fact that that price that was paid in his death has brought us together with God. That that's what the cross reminds us of in just just a nutshell of reconciliation with God at a terrible, horrible cost. So that's, that's why the cross figures so prominently. And why does this work? He says again, in order to present you before him. Now, I left a phrase out. We'll get to it in a second. But the point is, you've been reconciled and Jesus paid the price on your behalf so that Christ himself could literally present you before God. Again, passively, you've been presented to God because of what Christ has done on your behalf. Not because you did anything. You've been presented. So it's like a gift in a way, presented before him. But we know that there's a problem that we cannot be in the presence of God because he's holy and righteous and sinless and he looks on the sin of of what we've committed and he sees that sin and it separates us from him. So how is it that us, sinful dirt bags full of problems, can actually be brought as a present before God for reconciliation when we are so street urchin dirty? How is that possible? Which is really the greatest conflict of the entire Bible. How can a loving God be with a sinful man? I mean, how is that possible? But he says right here, because of what Christ did, we, he, he, Christ has brought us in the presence of God, the reconciliation. And how? It's the middle line. What happened to us because of his death? He has presented us before him because he's made us holy and blameless and above reproach. Great words. Holy always has the idea of separation in it, which means that you've been separated from this place that's contaminated with sin and gets you dirty when you walk on it. You got to have your feet cleaned because you walk in dirt. We've been separated from that, separated from, but more importantly, separated to relationship with God. So holy doesn't just mean no sins. It means separated out of the world of sin and brought into his presence. That's what holy means. It means separated out. So he made you separate it out. Remember when Jesus says, I'm not from here, I'm from there. You're from below, I'm from above. And then when he prays for the apostles, 
He prays to the apostles in John and says, they're not from here either anymore. They've been separated because of their belief in Christ. So that's what he's talking about, the separation idea. Blameless? Okay, that means, whole, that means no sin. <laughs> and the word they used when they would choose lambs for sacrifice, you had to pick a lamb that was spotless without any kind of problems at all, cosmetically perfect. That's what this means. No blemishes. Literally, no blemishes. You have been presented before God with no blemishes. Well, I can make you a list of my blemishes. (laughs) But Christ, because of his death for us, has pulled those away from us, has dissociated those from us, removed them as far as the east is from the west, dropped them in the depths of the ocean, and now it's not a barrier in relationship. Now, now, when God sees you, he sees the lack of blemish that Jesus had. No spots, no wrinkles, perfect. He sees Christ. Oh, wow, I couldn't do that. You're right, he did that. And then the last thing, not only are you separated out of the sinful world and you're now seen as being spotless, you're above reproach. Well, reproach is when someone criticizes you in front of someone else. It's what goes on a lot in, a lot in politics today. <laughs> My running mate has done this, 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 this. That's called reproach. When you lay claims publicly to someone and say, don't vote for that person because they've done these nasty, nasty things. That's what they've done. That's reproach. Well, what he's saying is that when you're presented before God, no one can stand in front of God and point at you and say, yeah, but they did this. That's not going to happen. And interestingly enough, whose role is that reproach in the Bible? Satan's. He's the accuser of the brethren. So what he's saying right here is that because of what Christ did physically on the cross to die for us, now he can present us before God and present us separated from this world of sin, present us as having no blemishes at all, and also present it in such a way that no one can point a finger and say, yeah, but there will be no you have buts anymore. It's done. Satan can no longer point his finger and say, yeah, but. You know what they did? That's gone. It's taken away. Those, those three words right there about who you are have got to be the most encouraging words for me in the entire New Testament. <laughs> what Christ did on your behalf has utterly changed who you are for the purposes of being brought near to God in reconciliation. That's, I'm speechless. I mean, that, that's, that's it. That's what happened when the mystery came to these guys and when the mystery came to us as well. If indeed you continue in the faith. Now right here we read this and go, uh, wait a second, if indeed you continue in the faith, you mean if I mess up, I'm going to lose all this? What if I stop continuing in the faith tomorrow? And the first time I read this, I was a little disturbed by that too. It sounds like God did all this great stuff for us in the life and death of Jesus. And now if we just don't stay in it, we can lose it all. Yeah, well, if you look at if indeed, it'll put your hearts at rest a little bit. Because in the speech of the grammar here, he's not, it's not uh, what I said, it's not an issue of retaining the benefits of this. It's not that at all. It's really an issue of evidence of already having them. So what he's saying is, This benefit is to you, well, to you, if you're the people who do this. So these are things that will naturally be an outcome of your life if you've given your life to him and you've allowed him to be the payment on your behalf. Then these other things will follow. It's really not contingent. It's not a way of making, retaining these things by being, you know, faithful to the end. That's really not what it's talking about. He's saying, this is you if these other things are part of your life because he'll testify to you that that's evidence of you possessing this. That's really, that's the if he's saying right here. So in a way, I was thinking, what's a better way to translate that? Well, maybe presuming. So you have all that stuff. You've made, been made holy and blameless and, without, and above reproach. Uh, presuming that you display these other things. It's an evidence to you that you're actually part of that plan. So that's really what he's saying right here. It's not uh, you can fail and lose it all. It really, in the Greek, I, I looked a lot into this because that was very disturbing to me when I first ever read it. But it's clear this is what he's talking about. These are now evidences of people who are part of this plan they continue in the faith they're stable and they're steadfast they don't shift from the hope of the gospel that you heard these people are very stable in what they believe and they stand on it and again he uses uh, a word that we love to see before that stable word right there uh, means foundation literally in greek means foundation so so if you continue in the faith continue in all what what you've understood knowing that you have a foundation, you're stable, and the next word is your determination to stay on that foundation, steadfast. So you have a foundation, and you're standing on it. 
So I- if, this is, if this continues to be evidence of your life, then you indeed are part of this plan if you're stable there. You're not easily moved off that. Not shifting is jumping off of the foundation. Not shifting from the hope, again, the confident expectation of the future, of what God's promises. Not shifting from those promises of God uh, in, the, in the good news that you've heard. So he's saying this, this is the benefit to you. And if you display these things, then you've got it. This, this is evidence you've got it. This is you. You won't be shifted off of that. Someone who is easily shifted off of the good news and the hope of the gospel may not have originally really grasped it. You know? Again, it's sort of like winning the lottery and then later on saying, well, I'm not sure I really won it. <laughs> well, then maybe you didn't win it. Because <laughs> if you won it, you wouldn't shift from it, right? That's what he's talking about here. The mystery is something that has been so greatly beneficial to you it's going to be evidenced by the fact that you realize you have a foundation that can't be shaken. You're steadfast on it. You're not going to hop off it. And you're not shifting off to something else because it's that great. You get it. You get it. So it's really, that's what he's talking about. Presuming, presuming these things and you really are part of that plan. And this plan, this gospel, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So here he's saying this is the word that's not, it it is a mystery in terms of the Gentiles, in terms of Christ and us, but this is a message that's been proclaimed throughout the entire universe forever, is that God intends to dwell with man and vice versa with each other. That's always been the idea. That was the idea in Eden, right? Walk in the cool of the day, there goes God in the garden. I mean, that was always the intention for God and man to live together. Israel was the prototype community to show what happens when God and man lives together. A man kind of messed up, and, uh, but this is still the intention of God. And in the very end of the book, that's the intention of God. So he's saying this is really the very cool thing. This has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. Now, why does he say that, creation under heaven? Well, to let you know, not just in Israel. <laughs> Again, it's a dig at this kind of colloquial sort of ethnicism of the salvation. It's not. In fact, it is such a public thing, all heaven knows about it. It's not being held secret. This was God's intention from the very, very beginning. All creation. And it actually, it, it, it brings out a whole bunch of interesting speculations. Could it be, in fact, that the trees planted in front of your house know more about the salvation of God than you ever did? Ah, that creation itself groans, awaiting. Ah. Could it be that creation itself understands more the truth of God's intention for his creation than when we were born we ever got a clue to? That we had to have the mystery unveiled to us? Uh, it's, it's been proclaimed. God is not keeping a secret. This is his intention from the very beginning of which I, Paul, became a diakonos, became a simple servant, a steward of this great mystery and actually I brought to you. Whew. Again, if I was on a desert island, I'd want this page. <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, I'm going to do this too. Remember why I said a while back it's always fun to try summarizing it in your own words? Well, and some of you actually tried it. It's, it's not only just great fun, it's, it's really a great challenge as you understand what the microscopic word means. You put in your own words. It's just, and then you stand back and read it and go, wow. Not because you're so great, but because the summarizing of such big thoughts that start here in such little words into more your words. It personalizes it. it. I mean, it just, it, it brings me to tears when I do this, when I write it myself, because I just can't believe it. I mean, think about this. We are here at the end of a section in Colossians where he started off talking about Jesus as being the first over the entire universe, <laughs> right? Look at the scope. Jesus is bigger than the universe because he made everything and everything came into existence with him. He's not only first in the universe, but he's first over the entire collected organism of the believers in Christ worldwide. Wow. And now... He's in you. What? Yes. The contrast is shocking. The creator of the universe, when I go out at night and I look at the stars, the one who made that lives in you. Why? Because the entirety, the entire purpose, the teleos of creation was to be reunited and reconciled with God. Wow. Including those who will yield to the plan will buy into that wow so instead of me summarizing it i got someone else's summary for you (laughs) and i dialed back two weeks and i want you to see this summary this summary comes from the message which is written by eugene peterson and it's basically eugene peterson taking the bible and putting in his own words 
It's not a literal translation, not meant to be. This is Peterson doing what I've done and what I was challenging you to do. He just puts in his own words. So I want you to, I'm going to show you this whole section going back, you know, a week or two and look at this whole section and you'll, and when you stand back and read this, I mean, seatbelts fastened. Here we go. I want you to know how glad I am that it's me sitting here in this jail and not you. (laughs) There's a lot of suffering to be entered into in this world, the kind of suffering Christ takes on. I welcome the chance to take my share in the church's part of that suffering. When I became a servant in this church, I experienced this suffering as a sheer gift. God's way of helping me serve you, laying out the whole truth. This mystery has been kept in the dark for a long time, but now it's out in the open. God wanted everyone, not just Jews, to know this rich and glorious secret inside and out, regardless of their background, regardless of their religious standing. The mystery, in a nutshell, is just this. Christ is in you. So therefore, you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. It's that simple. It's that simple. That's the substance of our message. We preach Christ, warning people not to add to the message. We teach in a spirit of profound common sense so that we can bring each person to maturity. To be mature is to be basic. Christ. No more, no less. That's what I'm working so hard at day after day, year after year, doing my best with the energy God so generously gives me. You yourselves are a case study in what he does. At one time, you all had backs turned to God, thinking rebellious thoughts of him, giving him trouble every chance you got. But now... By giving himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought you over to God's side and put your lives together, whole and holy in his presence. You don't walk away from a gift like that. You stay grounded and steady in that bond of trust, constantly tuned into the message, careful not to be distracted or diverted. There is no other message, just this one. Every creature under heaven gets the same message. And I, Paul, am a messenger of this message. Wow! Isn't that awesome? Well, it's just what we read. (laughs) But kind of enlarged. And by the way, I'll put in one last plug for Ephesians 3. Because if you want to read someone else who has summarized what we just read in Colossians 1, read Paul himself do it in Ephesians 3. Because he does it twice. And Ephesians 3 has more words but it's the same content, it'll blow your socks off. And, and, at the end of Ephesians 3, not only does he say he's praying that we'll be filled with the fullness of God, but he's saying that you will be reconciled with God for the purposes of understanding the four-dimensional love of God. That's, that's mind-blowing. So read Ephesians 3, it's Paul again saying the same thing a different time. It's just, boy, Ephesians 3 will knock you over. If you got seatbelts on the chair, you read on, it's just got to, wow. So it's just awesome. This is, this is, this is everything. We're going to do the reason because the reason is the message. It's the reason why we sing. It's because of who Jesus is and what he's done on our behalf. It's nothing that we did. Nothing we did. Chapter 3 of Ephesians, all of chapter 3. Maps directly to Colossians that we've read for the last two weeks. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, awesome, awesome, awesome. That you might be filled with the fullness of God. Wow. So that you might know the length and breadth and width and depth and height of the love of God. Oh my gosh. Let's pray. Father, this is more than profound. I can't think of a big enough word. And it's, the irony is that it seems so incredibly simple And yet its impact continues to stagger me, staggers us, staggered the Colossians who read this. This is an astonishing thing that bringing this good news into our into our minds has now moved itself into our hearts. And we've yielded to the one who did what we could never do for ourselves in dying for us and bringing us into your presence and coming to understand the limitless dimensions of your love for us. Lord, we are so blessed by your nearness to us, your being in us and us being in you. Lord, I pray in a real practical sense 
that for those of us that struggle with coming to understand you in such an intimate way that you would you would meet them in their in their uh, doubt in their frustration that you'd come to display yourself and the magnitude of your love for them uh, in everyday life and in the places that you take us to and that you would that you'd make yourself known to us because lord we want to know you more we want to know you deeply <coughs> i can't help but think that during the times jesus walked on the earth that people just hungered for having more of jesus tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that and lord we hunger for more of you as well and Lord, for those who, who don't really have a clue what we're talking about, that I, I pray that you'd impress upon their hearts the, sim- the simple thing that we need to do in terms of yielding to you, recognizing what Christ has done on our behalf, recognizing that we were uh, alienated and devising evil and just into weird stuff. I mean, we were terminally stuck in our own selfish sinfulness. And, and then, Lord, all we need to do is cry out to you and say, save me, and you will. So I pray that those who are listening who don't understand but want, want this. Uh, what Jesus himself and the church says at the end of Revelation is to come and, and buy water without cost. It doesn't cost you anything, but you can have it. But you can have it if you just yield to you and your plan for us. Thank you for your great, great loving kindness. And Lord, we look forward even from this point forward to understanding more the depth of your love for us as we come to more intimate knowledge and experience with you as we walk this life you've given to us. So thank you now for your great mercy and grace shown to us through Christ and what he did in our behalf. So thanks now in Jesus' name. Amen.